Hey everyone, and welcome to the first in a new series of videos where we're going to be exploring the psychology of social influence. Social influence is all about how other people's behaviour can shape and change our behaviour. And in these series, we're going to be looking at conformity, obedience to authority, and how it is we can learn to resist the influence of other people. So let's dive in. Conformity can be defined as a change in behaviour or beliefs as a result of real or imagined group pressure. In this video, we're going to be looking at conformity in terms of one, the research of Solomon Ash and his variations, two, types of conformity, and then lastly, explanations of conformity. There are different types of conformity. First of all, there is compliance. Compliance involves simply going along with others in public, but privately maintaining your own personal views and behaviour. Also, compliance tends to be temporary, that you conform to that behaviour as long as you're with that group, but the moment you leave them, you cease to do that behaviour. In contrast is internalisation. This is where you accept the group's beliefs and behaviours as your own. In other words, you take inside of yourself, you internalise that group's beliefs. Notice here with internalisation that both your public and your private behaviour change. And it also tends to be a more permanent behavioural change. So that when you are with the group, you conform to the beliefs of the group. But also when you're not with them, you maintain that belief and those behaviours. Our final form of conformity is identification. This is where a person's behaviour or belief change because they want to be associated with a particular group. However, with identification, this may mean that there is no internal personal change to their beliefs. A good example of this is Zimbardo's Stanford Prison Experiment, which we'll be coming to in part two of our videos on conformity. This involved participants conforming to the social role of either a prisoner or a guard but their behaviours ceased to conform to those roles once the experiment was over. Now we get into our explanations of conformity, and these are tied and linked to our types of conformity, which hopefully you'll see shortly. There are two explanations for conformity that you need to be aware of. Firstly, there is what is known as normative social influence, NSI. People conform because they have the desire to be liked. Normative social influence explains conformity because it states that we go along with the behaviour of others because we have a fear of rejection. You can't wear a tank top two days in a row and you can only wear your hair in a ponytail once a week. So I guess you pick today. Oh, and we only wear jeans or track pants on Fridays. And underlying that is because we have a desire to be liked, to fit in. For example, let me introduce you to Steve. Steve has a new job and it's his first week at the job. And when he's chatting with his colleagues, a lot of them are talking about how much they love Apple products and Apple phones and they just couldn't imagine using any other phone or any other operating system. For them, the Apple ecosystem is just, is just it. Steve doesn't agree with what these guys think. In fact, he thinks Apple products are overpriced and that these guys are just a bunch of Apple fanboys. However, when the conversation turned around to Steve so that they asked him what he thought, he expressed that he had quite a lot of admiration for Apple. And in fact, when he was going to upgrade his phone next, he might even upgrade to an iPhone. What's going on here? Why did Steve's beliefs change? According to normative social influence, Steve's behaviours and beliefs changed because he had a fear of rejection in his new job and he wanted to try to fit in so that he could be liked. Normative social influence. Notice the connection now. Normative social influence often goes together with compliance. Remember we said that compliance was temporary and it was a public opinion but not private. And notice in Steve's case, it was a public expression of belief about Apple products, but privately, he didn't really like them. 
and also temporarily, as soon as he left work and went home, he wouldn't be going home buying an iPhone anytime soon. Compliance and normative social influence go together. In contrast, the other explanation is known as informational social influence, ISI. This is where people conform because they have the desire to be right. For example, Emily's a university student and during her first year at university she made good friends with a bunch of very passionate vegans. Emily didn't particularly have any strong views about plant-based diets and she enjoyed a sweaty KFC just as much as the next person. Over the past few months, Emily's become quite moved by the information she's learned about how the meat industry often poorly treats animals. And she's been watching documentaries like Cowspiracy. A lot of people just keep their mouths shut because they don't want to they don't want to be the next one with the bullet to their head. I don't know that I would want to comment on that. As well as learning about many of the health benefits of a plant-based diet. And as a result, Emily has not only started to change her diet to adopt more plant-based recipes, but she's also joined the local university vegan group and is starting to share with her friends her views on a plant-based diet. How do we now explain Emily's change in behaviour? Notice how informational social influence would say that Emily's behaviour has changed because she has the desire to be right. She has gathered information and because of the information she's received, she now has changed her behaviour. Notice how informational social influence goes along with our type of conformity known as internalisation. This means that Emily's views are public and private and they're also permanent. This means that when Emily's with her friends, she adopts that plant-based vegan view. But when she's on her own and she can choose whatever else she wants to eat, she continues to have that view of a plant-based vegan diet. Now let's consider some of the supporting evidence for informational social influence and normative social influence. Firstly, let's look at Genis 1932. This experiment was very simple and involved a glass bottle being filled with beans. Participants were first asked to estimate how many beans they thought were in the glass bottle. Then participants were placed in a group and allowed to discuss together how many beans they thought and then had to produce a group estimate of the amount of beans. After the group discussion, the participants were given another opportunity to change their original individual score. What they found, no surprises, was that the majority of participants changed their original score to better fit with the majority agreed group. Now let me ask you a question. Which type of conformity and which explanation of conformity do you see in this study? In Genesis 1932, we can see internalisation at work. This is because their public view in the group was maintained to their private view when they were on their own and it was a permanent change. We can also see that the reason why they conformed was to do with informational social influence because they had a desire to find the right answer. This brings us to Ash, Solomon Ash, the researcher behind this experiment. Let's take a look at some of the footage from his original study so that we can see how he set it up. The experiment you'll be taking part in today involves the perception of lengths of lines. As you can see here, I have a number of cards, and on each card there are several lines. Your task is a very simple one. You're to look at the line on the left and determine which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. All right, we'll proceed in this order. You'll give your answer. Only one of the people in the group is a real subject, the fifth person with the white t-shirt. The others are confederates of the experimenter and have been told to give wrong answers on some of the trials. The experiment begins uneventfully as subjects give their judgments. Two, 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 two. Three. three, 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 three. But on the third trial, something happens. Two, two, two. Two. Uh, two. As Ash put it, the participant faced possibly for the first time in his life a situation in which a group unanimously contradicted the evidence of his senses.
Ash didn't stop there. After his original study, Ash had some further questions. Ash wanted to know, under what circumstances are people more likely to give in to the pressure that we feel to conform? So what Ash did was he did his same research again, but he used a different variation. He manipulated a different variable to see how much it would affect the outcome. Number one, group size. I wonder how many people you think are needed to influence you so that you would conform. Ash found that the significant number of people to make up a majority so that you feel the pressure to conform is no more than three people. Ash did this with three people, six people, eight people, 12 people, all the way up to 16 people. And Ash found there was no greater influence above three, but three was the significant figure. Quote Ash, the effect appeared in full force with a majority of three. Larger majorities of four, eight and 16 did not produce effects greater than a majority of three. Variation number two. This time, Ash decided to explore the variable of unanimity. Now, unanimity is where you have agreement amongst all people. And Ash wanted to know what would happen if there was just one person who broke up that majority view. So that, that meant the participant was no longer on their own. Two. In the previous experiment, the naive subject stood alone against the group. In this variation, Ash gave the naive subject a partner, here seated in the third position, who also gives the correct response. One. One. Two. One. Two. And Ash found that when you have unanimity broken that the conformity rate would drop it would drop from one third around 32 percent to 25 percent demonstrating the key influence that unanimity can have finally ashi's third variation involved manipulating how difficult the task was to do this ash simply changed how clearly the difference was between the lines Originally, it was very obvious and it was an unambiguous task. The line lengths were clearly different. When Ash made it a little bit more difficult by making the line lengths a lot closer, Ash found that conformity rates went up. Conformity increased when people felt less confident about their ability to judge the length of lines. Now let's return to everything we've learned about types of conformity and explanations of conformity and apply it to the research of Solomon Ash. After the 18 trials were over, Ash was interested to interview each of his participants to try to understand what was going on in their mind, what they were thinking as they felt the pressure to conform from everybody else in the group. When participants were interviewed after the experiment, most of them said that they did not really believe their conforming answers, but had gone along with the group for fear of being ridiculed or thought peculiar. Now notice, that clearly demonstrates normative social influence, compliance, the pressure to conform in order to be liked. Whereas the second comment about wanting to get the answer correct clearly demonstrates informational social influence, the desire to be right. So there it is, conformity part one. In this video, we've considered three types of conformity two explanations of conformity and one key study in the research of Solomon Ash. I hope this has helped your understanding and that you've gained insight into your own behaviour and the behaviour of others. Understanding conformity can help make sense of some of the reasons why people go along with the crowd, even when some of their choices don't fit with their character at all. In our next video, Conformity Part 2, we're going to be looking at Zimbardo's Stanford Prison Experiment. See you there.